Hello and welcome to the second exciting lesson on computer architecture. Today we're going to look at the CPU. So your lesson objective today is to learn the purpose of the CPU and its key features. If you take a look at the learning outcomes, you'll be pleased to see there should be a lot of words and phrases that you're already familiar with. In fact, if you have a good understanding of the previous lesson on von Neumann architecture, you'll probably find that about half of this will be quite familiar to you. So, again, if I cover something that you're already confident with, just free, feel free to skip ahead and move on to the next section. Right, let's take a look at a CPU and where it goes in a computer system. Here we have a nice Intel Core i7 CPU. And this is Intel's top-of-the-range consumer CPU. Quite expensive, very fast. The CPU itself isn't very big. We're usually looking at two or three square centimeters. Not that big. And it slots into the motherboard. You can see the backside has all the pins, and that's what will connect it through to the motherboard. So even though the motherboard itself is quite big, the CPU, despite its importance, is actually quite small. Of course, if you were to take a desktop PC apart, have a look inside, you wouldn't directly see the CPU. CPUs generate a lot of heat. Usually there'll be a cooler and a fan on the top to try and keep that heat down to manageable le levels. That's why computers tend to generate a lot of heat. Of course, remember, this is a desktop PC. Uh, if you were going to look at a mobile phone, a smartphone, um, a tablet computer like an iPad or a Kindle, you would see the same sort of thing, but it would be miniaturized quite a lot. The CPU would probably be smaller than your thumbnail, and the whole board would be obviously very small to fit into a small area. All right, so CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. The job of the CPU is to fetch instructions from memory, the RAM, decode the instructions, and then execute them. And the instructions, of course, are provided by the software program, the apps and the software that we run on our computers, on our smartphones, uh, that provide the functionality that we need. CPUs are made from billions of transistors. Transistors are effectively very small electric circuits. And these combine to build logic gates that process the data and instructions. The speed of your CPU is controlled by a clock. The clock is a tiny quartz crystal inside the CPU chip that ticks at a steady speed. The CPU can only do something when the clock ticks. In between each tick, it does nothing. During each tick, the CPU can process a single instruction. Well, actually, that is a bit of a simplification. How much a CPU can do in one clock cycle or one clock tick is a little bit more complicated than that. However, for GCSE computer science, that's all you need to know. We measure this clock speed in hertz, or cycles per second. One million cycles is called one million hertz, and is sorry, one million hertz is called a megahertz, and one billion cycles, or one billion hertz, is called a gigahertz. Usually we measure computer speed in gigahertz nowadays, which is a lot of these ticks every second. In fact, modern processors can operate at speeds of around three to four gigahertz. So you're looking at three to four billion cycles per second. So just take a moment to think about that. One, one, one. In every tick, it could be performing three, three and a half, four billion different instructions. That's why computers are very, very fast at doing calculations. Let's take a moment just to think of an overview of how a computer system works. We have input, we've got processing in the middle, and we've got output. And the processing is divided up into the CPU and its key features. 
We've got the RAM for storing programs and data while the computer is running. And we've got our long-term secondary storage that can hold information even when the computer is turned off. So if you think about this, you've got programs and data installed on your hard drive. If you double click on a program to get it started, it moves from your hard disk drive, which is storage, into your main memory or RAM, where each instruction can then be sent in turn to your CPU for processing. Now let's take a closer look at the CPU itself. So if you are familiar with the von Neumann architecture, this will come as no surprise to you. In fact, everything here is something that we've encountered in the previous lesson. Inside the CPU, we've got the control unit, we've got the ALU, we've got registers, and we've got these buses to connect the CPU to the other components inside the computer system. Again, this is just revision. We have the arithmetic logic unit, which does the calculations and the logical functions. We have a control unit, which is responsible for decoding the instructions and sending out signals to control how data moves around parts of the CPU and memory to execute those instructions. We have registers. Registers are memory locations within the CPU that have specific purposes and can be accessed very quickly. The reason they can be accessed so quickly is because they're built into the CPU. The data doesn't have to be transferred from RAM or the hard disk drive. The register is built into the system so it can operate those instructions very quickly. The important thing to realize about registers is that they hold a very limited amount of data. They're only holding the instruction and the data the computer is processing right at that very moment. And the registers that we've encountered so far are the memory address register, the memory data register, the accumulator, the program counter, and the current instruction register. You'll also have a lot of general purpose registers just for holding other little bits of information that the, the CPU needs while it's processing the instructions. But again, each of these registers is maybe only holding 64 bits of data, or perhaps 32 bits of data with older computers. So that's only a few bytes. Okay, another thing that is included in your CPU, wasn't on the diagram earlier, but it is very important, is what we call cache or cache memory. So the data and programs that you are running on your computer are stored in RAM. And your RAM on a modern system could be anything from one gigabyte to four gigabytes, eight gigabytes, 16 gigabytes, but usually not more than that and usually not less. So RAM has quite a lot of storage capacity, but it is comparatively slow to access when compared to the speed of the CPU and the registers inside it. In fact, RAM is much, much slower than your CPU. So you've got to take the data from the RAM, transfer it to the CPU, and that takes a long time. In fact, your CPU could spend a lot of its time just waiting for data to reach it from the RAM. And in fact, in older computer systems, we got a sort of bottleneck developing, where we had a CPU that was very fast, and in fact, much faster at performing operations than instructions and data could be transferred from RAM to the CPU. So you got a lot of wasted clock cycles, a lot of ticks where nothing could be done. Now, computer engineers are very smart people, and they found a way to deal with that. And since the title of this slide is cache memory, then cache memory is going to be the answer to this problem. Cache memory is a small amount of very fast memory that's built into the CPU. So you can think about it kind of a, as a kind of mid-stage between the RAM and the registers. It's not as big as RAM. In fact, it's measured in megabytes, not gigabytes. However, that's still a lot bigger than the register, which you can measure in a small, sorry, in the registers, that you can measure in a small number of bytes. On the other hand, Although it's a lot smaller than RAM, it's much, much faster.
It's not as fast as the registers, but it's much faster than the RAM. Because again, it's built into the CPU that gives it a lot more speed. It doesn't have to be transferred as far. Now, what do we do with cache? Well, we use it to, instor, in, to store instructions or data that are either frequency, frequently used or that are going to be used by the CPU in the next few fractions of a second. Your computer will be running algorithms that will be trying to work out what instructions and data are going to be needed in the next very small section of time and making sure those that data and those instructions are held in the cache ready to be fed into the registers as required. If there's stuff in the CPU cache that isn't going to be used in the next half a second, say, it'll get transferred back down to your RAM. Now, again, if you have a look at the diagram here, you can see we've got this memory hierarchy. We've got the hard disk at the bottom, very large, very slow. And as we move up, we get faster and faster, but the storage space gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Things are complicated further by the fact that the cache can be subdivided into different units. Commonly, you'll have three different types of cache. Level 1, Level 2, Level 3. Level 1 will be very small, but very fast. Level 3 will be bigger, but a bit slower. Any type of cache will be faster than RAM, however. You might be asking, well, if cache is so much faster, and cache is so much better than RAM, why don't, we just, why don't we just do away with the RAM and just have lots and lots of cache? Let's have gigabytes of cache instead of megabytes. And the reason we don't is basically cost. The quality of the silicon used in your cache memory is a lot better than the, than the ones that we use in the RAM. So it's much more expensive. Again, we're trying to build a nice balance here between speed, cost, efficiency, storage capacity. And we use this memory hierarchy so that we can have the data that we need most towards the top and the data we need it much later towards the bottom. Okay, again, let's cover something that we've already studied, buses. These allow, allow us to communicate around the computer system and it's a communication channel that we can use to send data and instructions around. There are lots of different types of buses on the computer. Again, here's a picture of a USB universal serial bus, which we use to transfer data between the computer and external devices, like your memory stick. In terms of the CPU, there are three buses that you need to know about. A control bus, a data bus, and an address bus. The first of these is the control bus. This carries the control signal around the CPU and memory, indicating whether the operation is a read or a write operation, and ensuring that the operation happens at the right time. And this is, of course, controlled by the control unit. It's one of its functions. We have an address bus. This carries memory addresses for memory locations to be read from or written to. This is unidirectional. It only works from the CPU to the memory. The address bus is what the MAR, the memory address register, uses. And third and finally, we have the data bus. This carries data between the CPU and the memory. For a write operation, the CPU will put the data on the data bus to be sent to memory. For a read operation, the data will be taken from a memory block and sent to the CPU. This is bi-directional. It can carry data from the CPU to memory and vice versa. So this is what your memory data register is going to use when it's transferring data and instructions. All right, let's go through a very brief summary of that. The purpose of the CPU is to process data and control other components within the computer system. The CPU is located on the motherboard. The three main parts of the CPU are the control unit, registers, and the arithmetic logic unit, which we've all encountered in the previous lesson. The three main buses we have to worry about are the data bus, the address bus,